So what we're going to do is go on a little journey. And uh, I feel very honored to be here today because today's the first anniversary of our mom passing away last year. And uh, she had a beautiful death in a palliative care facility. And uh, so we're celebrating her life. So I dedicate this to my mom, Anna. I'm sure she's awake wherever she is. What we're going to do is take a little journey. We're going to start from birth to as we grow to as we develop our lives and then as we uh, finally make our final exit. And uh, I'm going to build on the excellent presentations that we've heard so far. So there was a lot of richness in the stories and uh, building on some of the words of our speaker that just came before, hopefully what I could do is lay out a map of where I think we have great opportunities. And I've developed this uh, presentation so that you can use it. So if there's any way that you can tailor it and make it any better, it's uh, for you to use. I can give you the slides. I can provide you some advice as to how you can become a speaker as well. Because the more people that are singing this message, I think we'll be able to uh, really make changes at the end of the day. So let's get started. I've got way more slides than my time allows, which means I'm going to talk really fast. But I know that your brain can probably process the information faster than I can ever talk. So you'll be able to capture this. And I'd like to start always at the very beginning. So I can't think any more beginning than this. And what I want to do is I definitely want to talk about you. And I want to focus on the importance of you. Because I was reading those red stickers out there. And unless you're all joking, uh, we've got a pretty confused audience. right? <laughs> All those stickers, if you go and read them, are, are pointing to, I sense, an opportunity. Now, I, I focus on this slide because this is the moment where it all starts. And the environment is so crucial. So the most pregnant, the most pregnant members of our society, as far as I'm concerned, are the most important members of our society. Because if a woman is under stress at the time of pregnancy, there's this field known as epigenetics. And epigenetics tells us that that stress is actually translated into the DNA of that fetus. So if a woman is under stress at the time she's pregnant, that stress gets converted into the DNA of that fetus. And so that child will be born with, one would assume, to be stressed genes. And then those genes are going to be passed on to the next generation as well. So the first lesson learned here, if you plan on getting pregnant, make absolutely sure you can reduce as much stress in your life as possible. And if you see a pregnant woman, or if there's a pregnant woman within your sphere, uh, be as supportive as you can, because those nine months are so incredibly crucial. Now, most of the time, everything works out well, and you end up with a beautiful little boy or girl. I chose a a unisex baby, so I can't tell if it's a boy or girl. But the, but the point is, if we're born with a full complement of genes, and if those genes are aligned the way they should be aligned, then that child, properly nourished, will have the opportunity to turn into something quite special. And then this is where it unfortunately starts to fall apart. So I'm assuming that you had a pretty good upbringing. The fact that you're here on a Saturday, the fact that you could find 100 bucks to pay for a ticket, the fact that you could afford the time to be here tells me that somebody took pretty good care of you, or you struggled against the odds and you made it here. So you are some of the most highest performing members of our society, and with that comes a responsibility, as we heard our previous speaker say, to do something good with it. Now, she mentioned the world that we live in, and it's a great world, and uh, if you've ever had an opportunity to travel around it, uh, you can see that it's a world that needs to be simplified a little bit. So if we take this complicated world that we have and we shrink it down to a village of 100, so you take the, I don't know, 8 billion people and shrink them down to a village of 100, this is what you would end up with. 60 Asians, 14 Africans, 12 Europeans, 8 Latin Americans, one from the South Pacific. And in the North Americas, like a Canadian would probably really represent only a quarter of a person. And so <laughs> I... I'm making a new slide, I didn't have it ready in time, but Canada has a very small footprint on the world. But the importance is, in this village of 100, these are the things that you should realize. In this village of 100, one person would own a computer, one person would have a university degree, 33 people would be without access to safe water, 14 would have no electricity, one would be dying of starvation, 
50 would be hungry, and 82% of them, or 82 of those people, would be living in poverty. So you look at this and you say, wow, are you sure? Well, you know, I've checked these facts quite, um, quite thoroughly, and unless you can show me that I'm wrong, these, these are the facts that I'm going to talk about. So simply put, what does, that, what does that say? That says that you, living in Canada, living in Alberta, are probably one of the most fortunate people on the planet. Canada is one of the richest countries on earth, and uh, without a doubt, Alberta is probably one of the richest provinces in this country. So the fact that you're sitting here right now means that there's a certain expectation of you at the end of the day. Now, this is where it all starts to break down. Okay, so that was the introduction that says, you know, life is uh, simple, and uh, somehow we screw it up. Now, you can challenge that and say, no, life is complex, and it's not screwed up. But uh, today, when I put this presentation together, I felt that life was simple and that we are screwing it up. Now, those biases come from working as an emergency physician at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. So I get to see the worst of the worst, don't I? No one ever has shown up in emergency saying, here's my family, we're eating well, we're sleeping well, everything's okay. We just thought we'd stop by and let you know that. <laughs> You know, my colleague, Dr. Jonathan White, one of our surgeons, uh, probably has never had any patient show up at the Alex with that story. So the point is, we've got to make sense of this. And so here's that little young one again. And in green, we know that the brain's ability to uh, develop is highest within the first 18 months of life. So within the first 18 months of life, the effort and energy that we as a society put into this little one here will determine whether they end up as this actor. This actor is portraying being homeless. We didn't harm anyone in this presentation. This is an actor. And the reality is that we spend way too much money at the end of the day on health, education, and welfare because we're not spending enough money at this stage. And the Norlean Foundation in Calgary has been doing great work. And if you want to find out more about it, just go to Norlean Foundation Calgary and uh, see what they've been working on. Now, this is where I have to tell you the truth. And the truth is that the healthcare system may contribute 25% of your health. But your health comes from things that you can't... Uh, sorry, let me go back here. Sorry about that. That's like the punchline. So, <laughs> so thanks. I just ruined a good joke there. <laughs> so these are things that you can't affect. So genetics and um, gender, basically, I mean, you could play with them a little bit, but the reality is uh, you are who you are. Uh, you'll have access to good housing if you can afford it, if you can afford to rent a good place or buy a good place. The only way you're going to be able to afford that is if you have income. The only way you're going to get income if you have education, and uh, literacy goes with that. Considering that 50% of Canadians are functionally illiterate, um, I think that's one place that we can start. Social status is so incredibly important. The first thing you want to know about someone when you first meet them is what? What do you do for a living? That's the first thing you want to know. No matter where you are on the planet, the first thing people want to know about you is, what do you do for a living? What's your social status? Your resilience, nutrition, employment conditions, physical environment, culture, child development, spirituality, safety, and social support networks are what determine whether you're going to be a healthy individual or not. The healthcare system may contribute a little bit, but not much. For millions of years, we were hunters and gatherers. We were designed to look like this, we were designed to constantly be on the go foraging for food. Well, within the last 27 years or so, we've gone from that to this. <laughs> and the reality, when all of a sudden you find yourself like this, the brain is very confused. And the brain's going to try and do something to make itself feel better. And the things that the brain's going to lean towards are this industry known as salt, fat, and sugar, and alcohol or spirits, or beer. And so the reason people are attracted to these things right here is very simple. Because the moment you do any of those activities, you immediately feel good. But unfortunately, the consequences of feeling good are obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and you can read the list. And that's why we need to create a healthcare system. Now, I want to simplify this for you. It's not that complicated. Three risk factors contribute to four diseases that account for 50% of the disease burden. Smoking, inactivity, poor nutrition, contribute to certain cancers, diabetes, chronic respiratory conditions, cardiovascular illness, and that accounts for 50% of the disease burden. 
And if you were to add brain health issues or mental health issues and then substance abuse to that equation, you can see that pretty well 75 to 85 percent of our healthcare system exists because of illness that's brought on by individuals' activities and society's pressures. So whenever I'm asked, how can you improve the healthcare system, my answer is very simple, get rid of the patient. <laughs> but why would you want to get rid of the patient when in this province, our healthcare system is the largest employer in Alberta? Over 100,000 people work for our healthcare system, right? With a budget of $16 billion annually. So the reality is this is what we're doing with that money. In the United States and Canada, we spend $2.8 trillion a year in healthcare. Now, obviously, the majority of it is going to be in the United States. But when you take a look at these complex systems and you see what's going on within them, these are figures from the United States. And when you take a look at how that money is spent, 35% of that money is totally wasted to the tune of $750 billion a year. Do you remember that slide about the village? Do you think $750 billion would buy a lot of goodwill, not only in our country, but overseas? Absolutely. So our job is to make absolutely sure you become as healthy as possible so that you understand your scorecard. So these are numbers that you should be very familiar with, with yourself. This is your personal health practice, and you have to know these numbers, and you have to know them well. You have to be able to know what foods to eat and not eat. The most important thing about food is to remember this. If it doesn't rot, don't eat it. <laughs> Actually, I've got a new line. I've got a new line now. Don't eat it or it will eat you. <laughs> so thank you to that previous speaker. I think in the future I'll always put that little zinger in there. We never talk about probably the single most important thing that determines your health. What do you think that is? I'll give you a second to think about it. What's the single most important thing in your life that determines whether you're going to be a healthy individual or not? It's love. And yet we don't talk about love. We're afraid to talk about love for some reason or another. Harvey Brenner at Hopkins told us it's the single most powerful determinant that decides what your health is like. Do we teach it in med school? I don't think so. Do we teach it in grade school? I don't think so. Yet it's such a powerful driver of our health. So remember, each of these slides is a one-hour presentation in itself. So these are some of my best slides, and I've just put them together to show you that there's so much we can talk about. And some of you probably know far more about some of these topics, topics than I do. But I can tell you that everybody wants to be happy. But do you know what happiness is? Well, ask yourself this question. Are you happy right now? And if you're not happy right now, you're not going to get happier unless you do something about it, right? Because happiness is very simple. You know, if you look at 100% of happiness, 50% is genetic. You either have it or you don't. You can't do much about that. You can get happier by buying stuff, but only about 10% more. But you can get 40% happier by doing what this TEDx organizing committee has done, which is volunteer to create this social support and this social network in front of us. So what they did was actually improve their own health. And so if you want to become a healthier individual, you've heard the challenge. The world needs your health. The world needs your expertise. Start to volunteering around the world will make you a better individual. Now, I have to do something that I, I, I don't like to do because it's probably illegal, but I'm, I'm going to push, I'm gonna push some drugs on you right now. Are you ready? <laughs> Take a look at the person next to you right now and smile. That, my friends, is the best way to push drugs because that's the most powerful thing that two humans can do to each other. And you notice how women guard their smiles because women know that it's that fleeting smile that would leave to love. Thank you very much. <laughs>